Self-Control, featuring quotes from Neville Goddard and Napoleon Hill. The premise of this video is the following statement, which I pulled from the Laws of Success philosophy by Napoleon Hill. Self-control is solely a matter of thought control. He says, please read the foregoing sentence out loud. Read it thoughtfully and meditate over it before reading further, because it is without doubt the most important single sentence of this entire course. Now, the truth is this. Most of our thoughts is a revelation of what is in our identity, how we believe reality to work, and potentially could be all of our thoughts. Now, what is the identity and why is this important when it comes to self-control and what Napoleon Hill is saying about thought control? Well, if we look here in the Robert Diltz model, we'll see the vision, identity, values and beliefs, capabilities, behaviors, and environment. Under identity, we've got values and beliefs, how we believe reality to work. How we believe rea reality to work is going to be what we are thinking. How we think about others, people, environment, circumstance, the information, the external world, and how we think about ourselves is going to be a revelation of what is in our identity. Our identity is our self-image. It's the identity that causes us to think a certain way, to have certain emotions, and to experience reality from a behavioral standpoint, from the perspective of either having self-control or not having self-control. So thus then, it's important for us to identify the identity, figure out what is our identity, who are we really? Now, the interesting thing about identity is much of our identity has formed throughout our life. Our thoughts, our emotions, our behaviors are a net result of our past. And until we live from the perspective of our vision, which is what we desire to create, which what Neville talks about, he refers to as the feeling of the wish fulfilled, then we'll always find ourselves biasing and orienting ourselves based on the present and reflecting on the past. In other words, what we do now is related to and is part of past information that we have in our mind that has formed an identity. Now, if it's success we're looking to create, then it's important then to create a vision, to understand what you desire, to be clear about it, and then have that impress on your subconscious mind so we can evolve this identity. Now, it is my belief that we have a true identity, a sense of identity that is so harmonious with our being and our purpose in life that if we make it a responsibility and a mission to identify this purpose, we will reflect back on our life and we will see that there was many instances in our life where we were given glimpses of this true identity. And based on the current level of consciousness that we are right now, which is knowing that most of reality is created via the subconscious mind, via the identity, then we can look and see what is harmonious and related to our vision and what is not by asking ourselves the simple question. If I was the person realized in that vision, in other words, if I became that person or I was living as that person right now who has the success that I desire to, who has the end result, would I be still thinking these same thoughts? Would I be still having these same emotions? Would I be doing these same behaviors? If the answer is no, then we reflect back and we'll realize that the reason why it is not so is because our thoughts and our emotions and our behaviors are governed by the identity that was built based on past experience, people, environment, and circumstance-based information, data, and meaning that we have assumed to be true in our mind, and as a result of that, we have formed an identity. Now, if we change the identity around, through subconscious mind reconditioning, through affirmations, through imagination, as well as behavioral changes by taking action, then what we'll notice is that our identity will change. And we'll notice that we'll automatically behave in certain ways. We will purposefully be doing what we're doing. We'll know why we are doing it and we'll find ourselves in flow. So I talk a lot about the concept of flow and flow is where challenge meets skill. 
It's a concept that I learned from the book flow by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. I'm going to put a link in the description. I recommend you watch it. Now, the idea is if you want to create success in your life, then there's going to be things you're going to be doing. There's going to be thoughts you're going to be having, and there's certain emotions that you have. And the goal is to be as congruent as possible with the vision. Congruent, reflecting back here in the Robert Diltz model, with the identity, the values and beliefs, capabilities, behaviors, and environment. And you don't have to be perfect at it because when you set yourself up to be oriented and aligned and you do the work on yourself internally, most of it is identity, what you'll find is that you'll automatically choose certain kinds of thoughts, behaviors, and actions, which will then impress the subconscious mind. And the subconscious mind will express it outwards as people, environment, circumstance, and information to further impress the subconscious mind to the point where you become automatic. Now, when I reflect back on my journey, I realized that in the beginning, early stages, I had to exercise a lot of self-control. I had to consciously ensure that I was putting habits in place. I was forcing myself to get out of bed at a certain time in the morning, forcing myself internally to go to the gym, forcing myself to stay disciplined and doing the things that I know I had to do to create the success that I wanted. And as I started to realize the success or have the success, and I've been on this journey now since 2004, consciously doing it since I read Think and Grow Rich, I realized that a lot of these things that I once exercised forced with, emotional force, internal force, and discipline, now became automatic. So I asked myself the question then, what is it that caused it to become automatic? Well, we know that habits, when repeated over and over again, they change the way we navigate reality from a physiological stand standpoint, from a neurological standpoint, and what we're talking about here from a deep subconscious identity standpoint. So the identity has changed. Now, after creating the first success and the second one and the third one and the fourth one, using the same process that I learned from Think and Grow Rich, what I realized is that most of it can be tracked, analyzed, and resolved in thought. So in other words, it's not the forcing of yourself that creates the results, because that's how I learned how to do it. It's the imagining of yourself and impressing the subconscious mind in your mind that can have the greatest impact on the performance that you have and your ability to stay focused on what is important. And as a result of doing it, and we're going to get into this through the discussion, you will experience reality of one from a perspective where you have a lot of self-control. You'll notice that a lot of people will comment and say to you, that you are a person that represents high discipline, high self-control. And they'll look at you and they'll talk to you like it's an impossibility for them because they might not have that and they can't understand what it's like to have an identity where it's an automatic expression where you have self-control. Self-control is the automatic expression because they'll assume that it takes a lot of work it takes a lot of discipline. It takes a lot of force. And as mentioned, my, in my journey, that's how I came about it. But I will promise you right now, the reason why I've been making a lot of videos lately talking about working on your imagination and impressing your subconscious mind from within, that it has the possibility and the potentiality and from experience and working with my clients, the ability to get you to have more behavioral change than external world-based force. Now, I recommend in the journey having a combination of both. As I've evolved in this journey, I rely more on impressing my subconscious mind. I also realize that all information, people, environment, and circumstance is all the time impressing my subconscious mind. And it's the meaning I give to this data that is either aligned or misaligned with the identity that I choose to assume, which is part of my true identity, which I have uncovered throughout the journey, that is in alignment with my vision. And what I have to do is ensure that the information is harmonious with this, encourage and surround myself with this information, and then that identity will be formed, which will be my true identity. Now, what is this true identity? Well, I believe that each person has greatness within them. Watch the video that I did on Science of Being Great by Wallace Waddles. The idea is that we all have greatness within us. We have unique greatness within us, and we have the ability to uncover this greatness and continuously express this greatness. And as a result of it, we share with others. We create, if you're an entrepreneur, products and services that are needed and useful, or you provide service as a result of your greatness, and as a result of what you put out, which is your greatness, you receive the equivalent 
in money, in success, in whatever it is that you want, well-being, it's yours. So then it becomes important to honor this true identity, which will be uncovered a little bit at a time to you, or it could be uncovered all at once. For me, it was a little bit at a time, which is a net result of bringing forth your definite chief aims. In other words, bringing forth your goals. So it's important then to develop self-control and use some of the things that I've talked about to help you with self-control in the external world. But what we're talking about here more so is working on yourself internally to realize that it's a matter of thought. Now, why is it a matter of thought? Well, we talk about this a lot. You become what you think about. Most of reality that you have created is a net result of the thinking that you have created within yourself or the thinking that you have allowed yourself to believe, which is a net result of other people's results or their ways of thinking. And this thinking may or may not be aligned with the identity that you choose to become or express authentically so that you will have the self-control to have the behaviors, the capabilities, and the environment choices automatically and even expression of creativity that is harmonious. So as a result of reflecting then and looking at what's in our external world and connecting it back to the thoughts we have, we'll realize that it's the thoughts that created it and it's okay that our thinking, a lot of it is from our past or from what we've learned from others, but we can change the thinking. And by changing the thinking, what you'll start to notice is you will automatically choose certain things. This is why we focus a lot on evolving values and beliefs, letting go of limiting beliefs. A few videos ago, I did a discussion on letting go of limiting beliefs. And what I found in the journey is that the more limiting beliefs I let go, the more I'm able to express, the more I'm able to identify my greatness, and the more I'm able to adjust my self-image within, which is my identity, to be harmonious with the vision. And then what you'll realize is that much of our identity, as much as we believed it to be who we are and we are fixed in our thoughts that we are that person, is actually just learned. And it's not who we really are. What we really are is beyond the identity. We are actually one with the vision. Now, I'm going to get a little far out here, but this is the important thing to recognize. When we say, I am successful, or I am healthy, or I am, whatever you put after I am, reveals your identity. So when you're communicating with others, and even when you talk to yourself, we talk about what to say when you talk to yourself, it's important then to recognize what you are identifying with, with the I am statements that you make, as well as how you believe reality to work. If, for example, you believe that money is a net result of frustration, hard work, and f just pure, pure force, then as you believe, so it shall be done unto you. Now, this is something that I've actually evolved within, because with working with the concepts of thinking grow rich, I remember him saying it in there. He said, if you believe that money is a net result of hard work alone, perish the thought. So I said, you know what? From what I've learned in my life, and this was back in the day, all money that I've ever made or I see anyone making is a net result of hard work. So how could this be true? But I kept an open mind and allowed to myself to embrace that idea that money is a net result of creating products and services that are needed and useful and value for others and that may or may not include hard work. It's really about being able to create that and deliver it. And then I started coming across concepts where it encourages doing what you love to do that you're passionate about. So what you do to create that value and deliver that value and fulfill that value isn't necessarily from a place of hard work, but from a place of passion and joy. Now, as a result of adopting that idea, I found myself then creating money from a place of joy, bliss, and ease and doing what I love to do. And in relation to what we're talking about here, I found myself doing the behaviors that were optimal automatically. As a result of changing my identity around money, I no longer found myself forcing myself to do the things that would bring in the money. Now, as a result of taking on hundreds of coaching clients and working with many businesses and consulting throughout my journey, I realized that the ability and inability for a person to do the optimal capabilities and behaviors that will produce the results that they want has everything to do with this identity. And a lot of times they don't know the identity. So they will then conclude that they don't have the self-control. 
But what is really happening is that they have self-control. It's just to things that are not harmonious to the ideal identity that they want to be at consciously that is related to the vision or harmonious with the vision. But instead, they have a identity within themselves that is automatically desiring to do certain kinds of activities that are inharmonious. Now, it's not the desire, it's how the desire is expressed. We're going to talk about this in a moment. So it's important then to study the Robert Diltz model because each of these layers give us clues as to where we have to evolve ourselves within. Is it a vision thing? Is it an identity thing? And most of us right now need to focus on identity, including myself, to have a, a high level of self-control. A lot of times we'll tend to focus on behaviors, forcing ourselves to do it. And this was okay in certain states of consciousness. But now that our consciousness has risen up, we realize that most of what we do and how we behave is subconscious. And we can try to forcefully do things, but that will result in symptoms in the external world. See, we can either live from a cause-based perspective, in other words, all the power is within and it is within, or we could live from an effect-based perspective where we try to change the external world. What I found in my journey, and I started out in the journey, trying to change the external world and did produce results, I found it's far more effective to change the cause within. And the cause within is the identity within, and we can discover the identity at a thought level. What we say when we talk to ourselves, what we say when we talk to others, how we communicate about people, environment, circumstance, and information reveals to us about our thoughts, which we can cross-reference then to the identity and then realize if the identity is harmonious to the optimal values and beliefs and behaviors and the vision that we want to create or not. And then we can evolve the identity within through imagination or affirmations. Let's talk about enthusiasm and desire. The truth is to evolve the identity within, to create anything that you want to create as far as what you desire or a vision, you have to have a desire to do so. Now, we are born with desire. We have desires within us. And a lot of times we misunderstand our desires if we have inharmonious programming in our subconscious mind. So it's not then the desire that's the problem. It's how we interpret the desire and how we express the desire. Do we express the desire in a way that's benefiting us, others, and divine or evolution? Or are we expressing the desire in which it's self-serving or self-sabotaging? And then we might conclude that the desire is the problem. It's not the desire. It is how we interpret the desire. We all have desires. We have a desire to get out of bed in the morning. We have a desire to live. We have a desire to create success in our lives. And if we don't have the desire to do something harmoniously, we have to ask ourselves, what is happening to the desire within? One of the things that I've realized on this journey from cleansing my subconscious mind is as I removed the limiting beliefs and the different elements of how I believe reality to work that was a net result of elements that I have learned from my past that was causing me to misinterpret my desires, automatically, through automatic self-control, you could say, I was doing the optimal behaviors, thinking the right way, and creating the results, having the certain emotions that are harmonious, seeing reality from the perspective of understanding rather than from a place of resentment. And then as these desires began to express, I started to have a greater degree of understanding of myself and acceptance of myself. And then the desires started to flow through me and express themselves in a way where I experience an unstoppable level of self-control. So thus, then what I notice right now is that certain things that I put on my schedule or things that I want to do, I will automatically do it. I won't find myself distracted. I'll start it and finish it all the way through because what I'm allowing myself to do is express the desires via valid, harmonious programming in my subconscious mind, which I have instilled, that is aligned with the identity that is aligned with the vision. And thus it expresses automatically. And I'm not forcing myself. I'm not even trying. I am expressing. He says, you come now to the study of self-control, through which you may direct your enthusiasm to constructive ends. Without self-control, enthusiasm resembles the unharnessed lightning of an electrical storm, 
It may strike anywhere. It may destroy life and property. So there has been many people who have, who have experienced in their life, a lot of desire, a lot of need to express the enthusiasm. But however, that is expressed in a way that is inharmonious because of the programming that is in their subconscious mind that has formed their identity. And as a result, they express in a destructive way. See, we have enthusiasm when you were children and you were expressing, you did it unapologetically. You just express and you did things. And then we were taught that we shouldn't do certain things. Now, maybe those things that we shouldn't do were not beneficial for us. But one of the things we might have assumed during that, and I know that was the case for me and many others that I talked to, is that the expressing is bad. The having the enthusiasm is bad. So as a result, we begin to bottle it up inside, close ourselves off, repress it. This results in inharmonious expression because what you resist will persist. And when it expresses, it's going to express in a way that is not going to be harmonious for you or others, and probably in a way that's destructive for you and others. So then we have to go back and realize that if we were taught that, that that's not the best way to navigate reality. We have to allow our enthusiasm and desires to be encouraged again and just have it understood at a certain level. And now we have the ability and the consciousness to know what they mean and to realize that they come from a good place. And when understood, they will be expressed from a great place and steered towards our definite chief aim. Now, one of the things you always hear me say is that everything is related to your definite chief aim and your definite chief aim is related to everything else. All areas of your life, all people, environment, circumstance, and information is harmonious and related. The question is, do we believe it is? If we don't believe it is, then we have programming in our subconscious mind that creates that separation. And if we have that kind of programming in our subconscious mind, what you'll find is that also you have a difficulty expressing. When I work with individuals, what I find is that those that have an inability to express themselves or have difficulty expressing themselves also look at reality as one that is not favorable to them or they do not see the harmoniousness and the contributions to their life in reality. They see the world as against them. And what this is, is a lot of times a desire to express that has been confused in the subconscious mind through inharmonious programming that they've learned that is now causing further confusion and it's not allowing the energy to flow. The energy needs to flow from desire and automatic expression. Now, David Hawkins talks about this in Letting Go and power versus force. He says that we can evolve ourselves to a state, and we've done this because we've experienced this in many stages of our lives, or right now if you take an inventory, you could probably find where you're doing this, where you can create results automatically. You can manifest and bring forth in reality what you desire without even knowing that you desire it. You look at something that is in your life and you say, wow, that's what I want in my life, and it's there. And it happened in a way where you could not analyze and track back that it was a desire that was aligned with an identity. And by having that desire and the vision impressed in your subconscious mind really fast, it was brought forth. You're not able to see that sequence because it happens so fast. Now, that's what he means by desirelessness. It's when we are one with it. Because the truth is this, all is one and we are individual expressions of the same mind and everything is one. We create separations so we can understand. We like to break things apart because that's the human way of understanding. But the truth is all is one. So then the desire and the expression of the harmonious desire is actually one. And when it's not appearing to be as one, then there's a misalignment, something that you can use the Robert Diltz model or you can use the mental, emotional, physical, spiritual model, realizing that all of those, when they are in harmony, we experience instant manifestation. Now, if there is misalignment, then we will have symptoms. And the symptoms are in our thoughts. Again, reflecting back to what Napoleon Hill said, it's not about self-control. It's about thought control. Because what is the self? The self transcends the identity. It's beyond the identity. When we say myself, what we're really referring to is something beyond the identity. Because if you can change the identity, then you are not the identity. You are something beyond the identity. So thus then, it's not the self-control, it's the thought control because the thoughts are the symptoms that reveal the identity. Enthusiasm is the vital quality that arouses you to action. With self-control, while self-control is the balance wheel that directs your action so that it will build up and not tear down. So if we're saying that self-control is really thought control 
and enthusiasm and desire are important so that we can live and create the kind of life that we want, so we can contribute to others, so we can be of value, then the question is, how are we expressing? If we're expressing in a way that appears as lack of self-control, it's still somehow getting expressed. Where is it being expressed? Think about this for a moment. Reflect back on your behaviors. Do you have certain behaviors that are expressed in a certain way in which you call them lack of certain or lack of self-control? See, it's the desire, it's the enthusiasm expressing a certain way based on subconscious programming of belief of how you have identified to express that enthusiasm. So when he says that self-control is the balance wheel that directs your action, and we say thought control, that's what it's really about, then it's the way of thinking that will allow you to express that enthusiasm. For example, if somebody is going to start a business and they have to go out and sell, and they're enthusiastic about it, and they experience rejection from vendors or clients or deal makers or whatever, getting funding, and they identify with that rejection as shameful or something negative within, then they will have certain thoughts about that interaction about themselves and others. Now, those thoughts are probably, if they're inharmonious, going to get that person to prevent expressing that enthusiasm of their business in a way that is harmonious to actually go out and do it again and again and again to the point where they get the sales and even learn from the experience. So then what will happen is that these thoughts will go in and form an identity or they will also reveal through the behavioral elements that were expressed what kind of identity exists within the person. They have certain meaning that is associated with rejection. Now, when we change our thoughts and we change our identity around via subconscious programming and imaginal acts and working with the subconscious mind within, and what you'll notice is you'll have different thoughts, and then those thoughts are going to be more in alignment with something like rejection is actually good because then I can get optimization data and I could figure out what I could do to make my offer better. I enjoy trying because I get a higher level of self-confidence. So you can see then the enthusiasm is being expressed. And when somebody observes them, they'll say, well, that person has a lot of self-control. They're in sales and they have no fear surrounding rejection. And as a result, they're hitting their numbers. They're growing really fast and they have a lot of self-control. Now, when we analyze them like we do, we'll realize that it's the thought control. It's the way of thinking that changed everything around. So by forcefully getting yourself to do the actions or make the sales calls or whatever it is, we're approaching it from a way that may work because I mentioned earlier in stages of my life, it was helpful, but it's one that involves unnecessary excessive force that may lead to burnout. To be a person who is well-balanced, you must be a person in whom enthusiasm and self-control are equalized. So we see it as one. So we talked about this earlier of how David Hawkins defines it, desire expressed instant manifestation. We didn't even realize that we had the desire. Well, the same is with enthusiasm and self-control. When you are aligned with enthusiasm and self-control, you automatically choose to get out of bed at a certain time in the morning. And if you get thrown off, you quickly want to get back on it again. And you automatically go to the gym and do your workouts. You automatically do the optimal behaviors. And this is a net result of evolving the identity within, which is revealed to us about our thoughts. He says, back of all achievement, back of all self-control, back of all thought control is that magic something called desire. So again, desire is important, which is why in Thinking More Rich, he puts emphasis on the burning desire. If you didn't ever had a desire, then you wouldn't create any goals. You have a desire to create the result. You enjoy that feeling that you want to experience after you get the end result. You have a desire to do it. And it's not necessarily the bringing forth the desire that matters, although that's very important. It's also who you become in the journey. So I mentioned this many times. If you ask me what's more important, the end result or the journey, I'll say both. There was a time in my life where I said, no, the end result is more important. And there was a time in my life where I savored the journey even more. But then I said to myself, what if it's all one? Well, as a result of embracing it all as one, I've noticed that enthusiasm and self-control have become equalized. And as a result, I'm having a lot more instant manifestations of parts of elements that are contributing factors to my definite chief aims and my goals are being brought forth even faster and I find myself in flow more often. 
Now, desire is important then because if we can identify what our desires are and realize that our desires are being expressed one way or another, then when we're reflecting back on this discussion, we'll say they're either being expressed in ways where we call it lack of self-control or they're being expressed in a way we call it self-control. So at the end of the day, what's happening is the desires are revealing to us about ourselves specifically what programming is in our subconscious mind that is revealing to us about the identity, that self-image that we have. Now, when we express something in reality in an inharmonious way, it's important then to not shame ourselves because then we'll form further negative identities surrounding the desire. It's important to forgive yourself, reflect upon what was created, and realize that what you are doing is revealing to you about yourself. What is being expressed in the external world is a revelation about self. And it's giving you understanding, data, and information that you can take and evolve the identity within. So if you experience a desire that is expressed in a way that is identified or is labeled, I should say, as lack of self-control, then we don't shame ourselves, we don't guilt ourselves, we, we create an affirmation and or we use the pruning shears of revision, I'll put a link in the description, Neville, great exercise, where you imagine yourself doing the thing differently and loving yourself doing it, seeing yourself, that particular outcome that was created, revising and redoing the scene in your mind and see yourself doing it a certain way that is harmonious, that is aligned with a full expression of the desire in a harmonious way and then what you'll notice is that you'll start automatically behaving like that more and more so many of us when we experience something where we call it lack of self-control we shame ourselves failing to realize that we are further impressing it on the subconscious mind to express again and again and again and this is why many of us have a hard time staying consistent on our workouts or doing the things that we know we have to do to create the success we want in our business because we're constantly shaming ourselves and impressing the subconscious mind over and over again. And the more we express and try, the more we tend to beat ourselves up because we don't like the feeling of how we are expressing. Failing to realize, because we didn't know in all fairness, that that was an automatic expression of the subconscious mind. See, the subconscious mind has one responsibility, to just create. That's all it is. We can impress the subconscious mind. We can't control or force the subconscious mind. We impress the subconscious mind and the subconscious mind will express. If you force the subconscious mind or apply force to try to change yourself, then force is what you'll experience in the external world. So if you then reflect upon what is created or what is done, which is the element that we call lack of self-control, we can understand then what it is, is that the desire to do something was expressed in a way that's inharmonious. Now we take that information and we do imaginal acts or the pruning shears of revision or subconscious mind affirmations and we believe it to be that way and we affirm it again and again and again, further impressing the subconscious mind of the new belief that will then go and evolve the identity to be in alignment. Then what you'll find yourself doing is the optimal behavior more and more so. Now, this might not happen overnight. This may happen, happen overnight. With certain things, for me, it does, and certain things take time, depending on how deeply rooted the thought is. But one thing I do know is that whatever is expressed, I do not shame the desire. I seek to understand how I am interpreting the desire via my identity in my subconscious mind, and I evolve that programming. He says, it is no misstatement to fact to say that you are limited only by the depth of your desires. So it's not the desire. And by depth, we're talking about at what point does it become inharmonious? At what point does it get interpreted in a way that it's expressed as a behavior or a way of looking at reality that we call not having self-control or lack of self-control? When your desires are strong enough, you will appear to possess superhuman powers to achieve. Now, what he's talking about is that we have the desires and we have something that we can also cultivate called the burning desire. This is the meditation and reflection on our vision to the point where our mind becomes so altered subconsciously and aligned with the vision that we want to create that we become extremely passionate about and desiring of 
all that is related and harmonious and contributing to our definite chief aim, which is in the external world, everything, and we can interpret it better. We can understand it better. And then we can then automatically choose the things and we will honor ourselves. We will have a desire to choose things that are harmonious. And if something shows up in our reality that is inharmonious in the way that not that it's not contributing. When I say it's contributing, it's revealing to you about yourself. It doesn't mean you have to do it. You just have to understand why it shows up so that you can then reflect upon it and change the cause within. So if it's inharmonious, it doesn't show up again. But if something shows up in your awareness that is harmonious, you'll interpret it as a synchronicity. You will feel a strong urge, a desire, an intuitive nudge. It will seem so crystal clear to you. And for me, a lot of times these things that show up in the external world sometimes seem to glow. And it's going to give you laser sharp precision of judgment to see an outcome where others can't see. For in business, this can help you tremendously. There's many ways to get to a destination of whatever success you want to create in business. And by applying these concepts here and understanding that the desire is a driving mechanism and it's either interpreted harmoniously or misinterpreted by the subconscious mind, making peace with it, not shaming ourselves and evolving the programming within, what you'll find is it's very easy for you to have clear distinction on the different elements that show up and Neville calls it the bridge of incidents and navigate reality through the most optimal bridge of incidents to create what you desire. If you are building, a, if you were in a building that was on fire and all the doors and windows were locked, the chances are that you would develop sufficient strength with which to break down the average door because of your intense desire to free yourself. So the idea here is that in certain situations, we allow ourselves to express. It's usually situations where our life is in danger or it matters a lot. See, we don't have to wait for those kind of moments to allow ourselves to express that way. We can recondition the subconscious mind so we can develop a certain level of urgency or a certain level of priority automatically, not from a place of force, so that we tap into these abilities that we might not have had before or identified that we've had before or realized that we've had before and see ourselves expressing from that perspective. So again, what is really happening here? The desires being understood, we automatically interpret it in a way that's aligned with the vision, VRI, our identity in our subconscious mind because we're evolving and doing the work within. And I mentioned this earlier, all of the work that I do nowadays, 99% of it is work within. And by changing my identity within, all these things that I talk about express automatically. Now, as you evolve that programming within, and the programming has been evolved within, you will then automatically express yourself in a way that's smooth and congruent. And a lot of times you might even not even realize what you did that was the optimal thing. That's why it's easy to reverse engineer somebody who has a very aligned identity with a level of success, vision-based success, and see what they're doing. But if we assume that that is the way to create success, then we're limiting ourselves because that person has probably an infinite ways, because they're tapped into infinite intelligence, and that's what we're talking about when we say infinite intelligence, infinite ways of creating success. And that was just one of the ways that was the fastest way. I think it's important to study so you can see clues of how people create success. I also believe it's important to realize that there's an infinite way of creating success, most of which have not been discovered. And if you follow this process, what you're going to find is you're going to tap into your own unique way of creating success. I know that I can speak this from experience and working with many coaching and consulting clients, hundreds, and seeing the same pattern over and over again. He says, if you, des if you desire to acquire the art of successful negotiation, as you undoubtedly will when you understand its significance in relation to your achievement of your definite chief aim, you will do so providing your desire is intense enough. Now, the reason why I put this in here is I want us to always reflect when, it's, when it comes time to creating success or doing the things that are related to creating success, primarily for entrepreneurship. A lot of it is going to be involving dealing with other people, negotiating and dealing. What I have found is that those that are the best at negotiating and dealing do it from a place of authenticity. They allow themselves to express their desires 
and what they say, what they do, how they communicate comes out in a way that is so optimal that a lot of times people assume that they took some program or some training, which, you know, they may have done it to complement that, but it comes from such a deep place of authenticity and desire to express that what will happen is that they will know what to say. They will do the right things. And I've managed to reflect a lot upon my experiences in my life, many situations in business where I had no idea what I was going to say when I showed up to the presentation or whatever sales deal that I was trying to put together, negotiation. But allowing myself to follow this process, cleansing my subconscious mind of limiting beliefs and disempowering elements that are in my identity and putting myself more in alignment with allowing the expression to happen and trusting and having faith that will be expressed properly, that when I showed up in that moment, I knew what to say exactly. It's almost like what they were saying was in slow motion. And when they started communicating and saying their objections to me or whatever situation that they might be concerned with as a result of doing the deal, I had no idea where that information came from. It was within me. It was within my subconscious or it was within infinite intelligence. But I was able to say it in a very distinct way, clear way, to the point where they agreed with it. And then so thus, it's very important to not only recognize that desires are important, but number two, that this whole idea of self-control, especially when it comes to dealing with people, because a lot of the uh, self-control issues that I find that I get reported about is dealing with people. For example, it's easy to, to kind of do our own thing, but when we're around people, we don't have the same level of composure. So we're not doing things in the most optimal way because we have certain kinds of beliefs of how we will be received when we express our desires. The fear is that when we express our desire, we're going to be met with some kind of resistance or negativity in the external world that will shame us. The truth is this, when we evolve the subconscious mind programming within, the desires are expressed in a way that's harmonious for you, harmonious for them, and harmonious for evolution and divine. That's what we call authenticity. So by providing your desires intense enough, it's really then a matter of saying, do you honor your desire enough? At any given point in your life, you have desires. As you express your desires, you'll actually start to tap into more energy within you, which is this desire energy, and then it'll build up like momentum. Momentum is a net result, and we talk about this in flow, of honoring the energies within, the desire, expressing it through whatever creative expression or thing you have to do, in a way where you enjoy doing it and you are submerged and emerged in the process, such as flow. And then this is a cycle process. So you express, more desire is revealed within you and expressed, and it starts to pour out of you with more and more energy, presence, precision, and then it turns into what we call the burning desire. Response and reflection. What we want to do is reflect back on what is revealed in the external world through people, environment, circumstance, and information, and understand how we interpret it. It's not necessarily about those elements, but it's the meaning we give to those elements, the external world, that determines what's in our identity. He says, when you deliberately choose the thoughts which dominate your mind and firmly refuse admittance to outside suggestions, you are exercising self-control in its highest and most efficient form. So the identity that we are looking to evolve within has been formed by certain kinds of meaning that we have assimilated and assumed to be true. Now, when you surround yourself with harmonious people, environment, circumstance, and information that is related and contributing to the identity that we need to assume to be us subconsciously, that is harmonious and related to our vision, what you'll find is that you'll automatically choose to honor that more and more so. Any kind of information that's contrary to it, you won't deny it. You might even seek to understand what it means, but you won't assimilate it as true for you if it's inharmonious. So this is not a place of denial. This is a place of understanding. You have not only the power to think, 
But what is a thousand times more important still, you have the power to control your thoughts and direct them to do your bidding. So we control our thoughts by observing what is being created in the external world and realizing that it's probably something that is within. We change that programming within via subconscious mind audios, affirmations, visualization, pruning shears of revision exercise. And then our thoughts begin to change. And those thoughts become habitual and harmonious. These thoughts are encouraging and uplifting and inducing as far as evoking the desire to be expressed in a certain way. And when it's expressed, it's expressed in a way that is what we call high level of self-control. In other words, the behaviors are aligned automatically. The thoughts, the emotions are aligned automatically to what we want to create because the identity has evolved within. And this is a net result of reflecting on what kind of response you get from the external world and realizing that the meaning we give to that response can be changed within. We can change all the meaning that we get from any response. And you don't have to do this all day long. You do it enough and you'll start to notice that you'll have more and more identity change within and your behaviors will be more aligned with a higher degree of what you call self-control. Let's talk a little bit about influence. A person with well-developed self-control will not permit himself to be influenced by the cynic or the pessimist, nor will he permit another person to do his thinking for him. So this is now when we're at a stage of implementing this to a certain degree, where we will start to trust and honor ourselves, listen to our own inner voice, realize that the process is quite actually simple on the surface. Doing the work is a matter of, in the earlier stages, unraveling a lot of things. But as you continue in this journey, it gets easier and easier. And the process is simple. What is being expressed in the world is a net result of programming that is within the subconscious mind that has formed an identity. And we can change this identity around by understanding what is revealed in the external world. And then as a result of realizing how powerful we can be influenced from the external world to change the identity again into a different direction, we become more honoring to the kind of information that we take in. So as a person with well-developed self-control will stimulate his imagination and his enthusiasm until they have produced action. So we're talking about here working with yourself at the mind level, changing the cause within. But he will then control the action and not permit it to control him. So what is expressed then is going to be harmonious. And you know how to change it within so you can change it around so you can change your behaviors around. And you don't become a net result of repetitive expression of certain behaviors that may serve you right now, but then later on, you'd want to change them and evolve them as you move into a different stage of your life. The bottom line is this, you can change all the behaviors that you express, all the thoughts and emotions that you express as a result of changing the subconscious identity within and you can change it again and again and again, because as we have talked about this, the identity is not static. Now, you might believe, depending on the stage that you're at, that this identity, how you believe yourself to be, is absolute and is totally never going to change. And as you believe, so it shall be done unto you. But if you've noticed throughout the journey of your life, you have changed. Certain viewpoints have changed. Certain behaviors have changed. And it has happened. Perhaps consciously you've done it, or you have maybe placed yourself in different environments and different situations where you change. That was information impressing on your subconscious mind and evolving that identity within. So whether you do this consciously or not, it's really up to you. But if you do it consciously, then you'll realize that you can keep changing this identity within. This identity is not static. Now, the goal is to, if you choose to, align with your true identity, which you can track back and realize that a lot of desires and certain interests that you've had, especially in early stages of life, we're actually revealing your unique greatness and how certain things are of interest of you, and then you'll choose to honor them, further uncovering this true identity. Because you can assume any identity that you want, but some identities, when assumed, might not bring you the kind of happiness and joy and fulfillment that you desire to feel. Instead, it might create a certain kind of expression that you might like the expression on some level, but deep down inside, it doesn't feel right. Perhaps it's a certain kind of career profession where maybe you assumed a certain identity to achieve that success in the career profession. And then you realize that it's not really who you are. And so now maybe you're making good money doing it, but you find yourself 
curious about other ways of expressing and you're maybe read the book the alchemist where he talks about how finding your personal legend was interesting to you and then you say well i kind of don't want to do this anymore there's something about this that doesn't seem right well perhaps that's because you have identified with a certain aspect of reality from the external world that said this is how you find the happiness now i've experienced that in my own journey and i realized that that was still a contributing factor because Robert Greene talks about this in mastery. Once you're able to create mastery once, no matter what it is, you're able to then create mastery again and again and again. So perhaps whatever career that you went into that you realize after a while that's not really you still taught you valuable skills and lessons which you can then use to when you shift your identity around within to be more in alignment with what you want to create because you're uncovering your greatness within, you'll find yourself already with the skills and certain understandings to be contributing factors. So no matter what stage we are in our life, we can then choose to find and honor our true identity and take all the lessons that we've learned up until this point to help us uncover it even more. So it actually propels us further. He says a person with a well-developed self-control will never under any circumstances slander another person or seek revenge for any cause whatsoever. Because that would be trying to fight with the external world. And the external world is the effect. The external world is there to help us understand about what is within ourselves. If we change the way we look at reality, our behaviors, our thoughts, who we associate with will change. We'll start to understand and have a greater degree of empathy and realize why a person got to where they are. And we won't feel the need to put them down so we can uplift ourselves because we realize that all the happiness, all the approval, and all the growth is within. The outer world is a reflection of the inner world. A lot of times you can seem very attached to this outer world, but as we evolve in this journey of consciousness and applying this information, we'll see that the outer world is actually a reflection. Now there are people and there are things happening in the outer world, but it is how we believe the outer world to work within, mostly in our identity, that is revealing to us what shows up in the external world, which is a net result of what we then call high degree of self-control. Because by evolving the identity within, by causing us to have a certain kind of expression, a harmonious expression of our desire, we choose our desires and our greatness to express a certain way, we'll do it. Certain behaviors, our thoughts, our actions, our attention will go into certain directions that are related. And then you'll say, wait a second, now all of a sudden I've got a high degree of self-control. And so whatever shows up in the external world that you don't agree with, you won't necessarily feel that you need to put it down or make negativity surrounding with it. You'll say, well, I don't agree with it. And just because I don't agree with it doesn't mean I need to fight it. I can do something about it if I can. And so this is what I'm going to do about it. Or I'm just going to go in this different direction because by going in this different direction, I'm not going to get emotionally pulled into a certain conflict which is going to then further impress the subconscious mind and evolve and create an identity surrounding that conflict which i'll have to remove at a later point anyways a person with a high self-control will not hate those who do not agree with them instead he will endeavor to understand the reason for the disagreement and profit by it and by profit by it what napoleon hill is talking about is not necessarily money but profit in understanding in wisdom in growth in benefit for you them and also evolution and divine. Let's go a little deeper into identity. He says, I had consciously psychoanalyzed myself, releasing over, releasing over the keys of my typewriter, the repressed emotions of hate and resentment, which I had been unintentionally gathering in my subconscious mind over long periods of years. Now, the reason why I put this in here is because there are many opportunities that we have to reveal what is our identity, our self-image. There's many clues. What we type, what we express, how we communicate, and the words we use reveal our identity. And these are clues. So if you see certain kinds of words and phraseology and statements coming out of your mouth, then what you're doing is reflecting upon it and saying, is this the kind of statements that would be the statements that I would make if I was at a certain level of identity or at a certain identity, which is harmonious and related to my vision. And then by changing the programming within, by changing the words we use, we impress the subconscious mind 
to be harmonious and related to the vision, and the behaviors and the self-control will flow accordingly. No one has any right to form an opinion that is not based either upon that which he believes to be facts or upon a reasonable hypothesis, yet, if you will observe yourself carefully, you will catch yourself forming opinions on nothing more substan substantial than your desire for a thing to be or not be. This is another way we reveal our identity. What is the opinions that we have towards people, environment, circumstance, and information? There is the facts based on certain dynamics that exist in the external world, and there are opinions on the facts. Now, just because there are facts in the external world that might not be harmonious, it doesn't mean that those facts need to be disempowering to you. There are many facts in the external world that will come true as a result of honoring and assuming the feeling of the wish fulfilled. Neville talks about this when he says, if external world facts deny the vision that you want to bring forth, the feeling of the wish fulfilled, then persist on it until you see it in reality, and then you will see it as fact, and then you will have new facts. So sometimes the facts that have been created are a net result of other people's thinking, or those facts serve a certain purpose. But those facts never have to disempower you. Those facts never have to reduce you into less than, because if you believe that they do, then that is your opinion. And if you have those opinions, then it's revealing to you something within your identity. And then you can change the identity as a result of what's being revealed within. And then you'll find yourself then being more harmonious with the facts in a way that will be not apparent to you until you become harmonious with those facts. So something will be revealed to you after. And you realize then that everything is directly or indirectly related and harmonious and supporting of your definite chief aim or what you desire to create. Place in your own mind, through the principle of auto-suggestion, the positive, constructive thoughts which harmonize with your definite chief aim in life. And that mind will transform those thoughts into physical reality and hand that back to you as a finished product. So this is a pinnacle thought to evolve in the identity. So I'll say it again. Through the principle of auto-suggestion, so either impressing your subconscious mind with imaginal acts, either impressing your mind with subconscious mind reconditioning audios, either impressing in your subconscious mind by surrounding yourself with people, environment, circumstance, or information that are supportive and contributive to your definite chief aim, the positive, constructive thoughts, this information will harmonize with your definite chief aim in life, and then your mind will transform those thoughts into physical reality and hand them back to you as a finished product. Why? Because we become what we think about. And the external world is a reflection of what is within. And most of what we see in the external world is a net result of our identity. And our identity is a way we assume reality to work. It may be opinion. And if it's inharmonious to what you desire to create, it is a fact that we are then assuming through opinion as disempowering to us. A fact may be fact, but the fact does not have to be assumed through opinion to be disempowering to you. So if someone says it is a fact that this is how it happens, and you look at the fact and say, well, for example, even if you look at business statistics, if you look at the facts, it'll say most businesses fail. Now, if you form a conclusion on your identity based on that fact, then you'll orient your mind to cause yourself to do certain kinds of behaviors that will appear as lack of self-control. But if you look at that fact and say, that may be the case for those entrepreneurs or those businesses, but I'm going to find unique ways to bring it forth that have never been brought forth before. And I realize that there's so many different ways to optimize a business, which by the way, watch the video I did on Jay Abraham's book, Mr. X. He literally gets into hundreds if not thousands of different distinct elements that one can do which most businesses don't do to help you create the business success so a lot of times you'll find that most businesses that fail it's not necessarily because they failed because of a circumstance outside of their control it's that they might not have saw the business from a certain perspective that allowed allowed them to pivot in a certain direction to create the success that we want and that's because of a level of thinking now to each their own 
And it's really about you and your contribution and dedication to create success. So you don't have to allow certain facts as disempowering as they may seem on the surface to form an opinion about your scope of potentiality. So then when we say, okay, well, this is the fact, we can change the meaning of this fact to be empowering and related to us and supportive to our definite chief aim by perhaps creating something that I said as far as a belief of all the potential possibilities that things you can do to evolve your business, then what you'll find is you'll automatically, because that will evolve the identity within through that belief, automatically do certain things. And a lot of these things will be subconscious and sometimes even appear miraculous. But they are the bridge of incidents that brings you to the success as you believe. As you believe, so it shall be done unto you. Neville Goddard says, Mastery of self-thought of your thoughts and feelings is your highest achievement. Okay, what we're talking about here is mastery of thought and self-control is thought control. However, until perfect self-control is attained so that in spite of appearances you feel all that you want to feel, use sleep and prayer to aid you in realizing your desired states. These are two gateways into the subconscious. Let's talk about these. Sleep. Night after night, you should assume the feeling of being, having, and witnessing that which you seek to be, possess, and see manifested. Never go to sleep feeling discouraged or dissatisfied. Never sleep in the consciousness of failure. Your subconscious, whose natural state is sleep, sees you as you believe yourself to be, and whether it be good, bad, or indifferent, the subconscious mind will faithfully embody your belief. So if you're going to sleep at night, not having gratitude on the successes, the wins of the day, not realizing that you are making progress, not realizing that all things are possible to him that believeth, then what will happen is that whatever contrarian belief that you have that is inharmonious to your vision will be impressed in the subconscious mind and will manifest the next day, next week as lack of self-control because lack of self-control is a symptom it is a symptom of certain kinds of thoughts that are being encouraged and these thoughts in collaboration with each other form the identity so the identity is being formed before going to sleep he says unless you consciously and purposefully define the attitude of mind with which you go to sleep you unconsciously go to sleep in the composite attitude of mind made up of all the feelings and reactions of the day. Now, if you had a very uplifting and positive day and you've been in flow and you've been honoring this stuff or you've been doing this work on yourself, evolving yourself within for an extended period of time, then it's safe to assume that when you go to sleep, it will further impress the subconscious mind, all that accumulated experience, and your success will keep increasing more and more so. But if this is not the case, then the pruning shears of revision, which is a great exercise, I recommend doing it, is important and also the awareness that whatever you dwell upon before you go to sleep is going to impress the subconscious mind and bring more because that's what the subconscious mind does its job is to express it's impressed either via the sixth sense or imagination or through five sensory data and meaning that's the only way it gets impressed and whatever is impressed it will express in some shape or form so he's talking about prayer now when we refer to prayer we're not talking about it necessarily in the traditional sense. Prayer is something that you impress on the subconscious mind via faith. It's belief. They're affirmation statements. And prayer in its essence works profoundly by impressing the subconscious mind. And if you believe in the more esoteric concepts, then that impression on the subconscious mind is sent up to infinite intelligence or the superconscious mind. And that superconscious mind and infinite intelligence is connected to all the minds of all people to help bring you your vision. So prayer is a very powerful tool, but when understood and done in a certain way, it has the ability to alter the consciousness, the mind, and also bring forth your results in ways we call infinite intelligence. Prayer is an illusion of sleep, which diminishes the impressions of the outer world and renders the mind more receptive to suggestion from within. The mind in prayer is in a state of relaxation and receptivity akin to the feeling attained just before dropping off to sleep. The perfectly disciplined man 
is always in tune with the wish as an accomplished fact. He knows that consciousness is the one and only reality, that ideas and feelings are facts of consciousness, and are as real as objects in space. Therefore, he never entertains a feeling that does not contribute to his happiness, for feelings are the causes of the actions and circumstance of life. So let's repeat that again, very important. He says, feelings which do not contribute to his happiness, for feelings are the causes of the actions. Okay, feelings are the causes of the actions and circumstance of life. So when we're talking about self-control, a lot of times we refer to controlling our actions. Now, whatever feelings that you assume and impress on the subconscious mind will cause you to have certain kinds of actions and will either interpret those actions as self-control or lack of self-control. The truth is this, your subconscious mind is just expressing. The behaviors are just expression. You can interpret it whatever way you want. It is an expression. You could even say that what most of us is on autopilot then. But understanding how this happens gives us enormous amount of power because we can change it via the cause within. And I'm going to give you a Napoleon Hill affirmation and prayer that you could use that I got from his Laws of Success book. Impressing the subconscious mind with happiness and feelings that are related and harmonious to your definite chief aim, the vision that you want to create evolves the identity within and results in certain kinds of behaviors, actions, which we call self-control. This process that I've discovered and revealed to you in this video, which is a culmination of everything I've learned, plus, plus principles that I've learned from Neville and Napoleon Hill and others in the journey, is the most powerful way, and I'll speak from experience, for myself and my clients, to get yourself to do the things you know you have to do to produce results without the use of force. I've tested this over and over again, and it is based on the sound principle of all causes within, and the subconscious mind automatically expresses. What we're doing is we're changing behaviors, getting ourselves to do things that we call high level of self-control, without the use of force, through impressing the subconscious mind. Watch the last video I did called Subconscious Mind Power Versus Force, if you want some deeper understanding into the concept. So here is the Napoleon Hill affirmation or prayer for self-control. He says, plant in your mind the seeds of a desire that is constructive by making the following your creed and the foundation of your code of ethics. When you affirm this kind of affirmation or prayer, then what you're doing is you're programming the subconscious mind to automatically express in a way self-control based behaviors, automatic expression. You will notice that it will keep increasing. And the more you see the increase, the more you will find self-confidence, the more you will find self-love, self-acceptance. Your self-esteem will go up and then you will continuously do it again and again and again, as in express the optimal behaviors, which is a net result of desire interpreted in a harmonious way, automatically expressed in thoughts, emotions, and feelings. And you're going to have gratitude towards that. And having gratitude towards that, reflecting upon it before you go to sleep with gratitude, further repeats the process again and again and again. So here it is. I wish to be of service to my fellow men as I journey through life. To do this, I have adopted this creed as a guide to be followed in dealing with my fellow beings. To train myself so that never under any circumstance I will find fault with any person, no matter how much I may disagree with him or how inferior his work may be, as long as I know he is sincerely trying to do his best. To respect my country, my profession, and myself. To be honest and fair with my fellow men as I expect them to be honest and fair with me to be a loyal citizen of my country, to speak of it with praise and act always as a worthy custodian of its good name, to be a person whose name carries weight wherever it goes, to base my expectations of reward on a solid foundation of service rendered, to be willing to pay the price of success in honest effort, to look upon my work as an opportunity to be seized with joy and made the most of, and not as a painful drudgery to be reluctantly endured. To remember that success lies within myself, 
in my own brain if difficulties occur to flow my way through them, to avoid procrastination in all its forms and never under any circumstances, put off until tomorrow any duty that should be performed today. Finally, to take a good grip on the joys of life so I may be courteous to men, faithful to friends, and true to God. If you want to copy this mind map, the link is in the description. Thank you very much for watching. I'll talk to you soon. Take care.